Um, I call the I call Dr. Deborah Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, this is a fascinating and an interesting bill. It has been a very complex bill to get to grips with. I think, as we've seen from some of the speeches this evening, I want to start, Mr. Chair, by thinking about. Um, the nature of tax avoidance in general, because this is an anti-avoidance bill. And you might think we already had enough anti-avoidance measures in our legislation already. And to start off with, I want to go back to a very, very famous judgment in tax law. Um, it's the Commissioners of Inland Revenue in the UK versus uh, the Duke of Westminster. It's a 1936 judgment. Uh, every man is entitled, if he can, to order his affairs so as that the tax attaching under the appropriate acts is less than it otherwise would be. If he succeeds in ordering them so as to secure this result, then however unappreciative the Commissioner of Inland Revenue or his fellow taxpayers may be of his ingenuity, he cannot be compelled to pay an increased tax. It's a very, very famous judgment, Mr. Chair. And what it is saying is that if uh, anyone can order, in this case, his affairs, so that they pay less tax, and it's all done perfectly within the law, uh, the letter of the law, then actually you're entitled to do that, because that's what the law says you'll do. So it's very broad. It gives you a huge permission, it gives people a huge, huge permission to structure their affairs in order to pay less tax. And actually, if you look at tax legislation over the years, what you will see is that legislators have successively cut away at that principle. And in fact, we've got a general anti-avoidance provision, Mr Chair, sitting in our own tax legislation, um, sitting there already. It's section BG1, and what it says is, paraphrasing just a little, it says, a tax avoidance <coughs> arrangement is void for income tax purposes. What that means is that the Commissioner can set that arrangement aside and assess the tax as though the arrangement had not been in place. But of course, in order to do that, you need to know what a tax avoidance arrangement is. And um, what it is, it is an arrangement that directly or indirectly has tax avoidance as its, perfect, as its purpose or effect, or as one of its um, purposes or effects. And so then you get down to what tax avoidance is. Well, it's directly or indirectly altering the incidence of any income tax. What's fascinating about this particular bill that's in front of us is that it's all about companies, multinational companies, that are trying to directly or indirectly alter the incidence of any income tax. So in a sense, this is a belt and braces bill. All right, the belt is already there. All right, with section BG1, and by the time you follow it through the definitions, it's already there. But as we know, corporate lawyers are very, very clever. Mm -hmm. Tax legislation is very complex, and clever, clever tax lawyers take every advantage of it they can. So what this legislation does is it bolsters section BG1 with respect to multinationals. It says, yes, we've got this general anti-avoidance provision, but we're bolstering it. We're, we're giving it more strength by having these very specific rules for multinationals. And they are indeed very specific. You know, they actually uh, only apply to a small number of companies. Uh, and just for the reassurance of Mr. Alistair Scott, there, there is some reason for that 40% rule. Look, that 40% rule comes in where we're trying to identify which companies in New Zealand we think are BEPS risks, which companies we think or well, the revenue thinks it ought to be investigating. And there are a couple of tests that have to be fulfilled. Now, the legislation as drafted had three tests in it. One of it was an EBITDA rule. And very roughly, if your interest was about um, a third, I think, of your EBITDA, then you were considered to be at risk. Now, for people who don't know what EBITDA is, an accounting measure called earnings before interest taxation, nice. depreciation, and amortisation. I do know my tax rules, Mr Brownlee. And when it comes to EBITDA, that? so that particular rule was found to be too harsh. Submitters said, no, that rule is too harsh. And they asked us if we couldn't take it out. 
So we've done that. And um, then there are two other bits. I just want to answer this, Mr. Chair, to carry on to answer uh, Mr. Scott. I just do want to answer Mr. Scott here. There are two tests left there. And you have to fulfil both of them. Now, so whatever our dairy companies do, our dairy farms do, doesn't really matter, Mr. Scott. What matters is what Maori nationals do. Okay? And if a, pair, uh, a New Zealand company has a high debt to equity ratio, and that's 40%. Now, we think that's pretty high in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And if it is also borrowing from a parent in a yes, low tax jurisdiction, but it is for Māori nationals, and let's just distinguish them from farming companies. So, and if it's fulfilling both those, then IRD considers them a BEPS risk. But it's still only a risk. It's not saying they're doing it, they are a BEPS risk and they might consider doing an investigation. And there's a de minimis there, right? A, a level of protection there, so that if there is $10 million um, or less of borrowing, then they're not going to be investigated as a BEPS risk. So there's quite a stringent set of criteria in there, and I hope that reassures you, Mr. Scott, as to what might be going on with dairy companies. So I think what you'll find with this legislation that was worked on very, very hard by many people in this House, both in the previous government and this current government, uh, the people who've sat on this committee right throughout, the select committee right throughout, and the people who have joined the select committee recently, is that we've worked really hard to get this right. It is complicated, it is difficult, it is hard to understand, it is highly technical. And we are very, very grateful to our excellent officials, to our excellent official advisor, um, Therese Turner, for the work they have done to help us to understand what's going on and to help us to really think through the implications. So I think we'll need to keep on working at this. I think we will find perhaps some things that could be done a little bit better. That's the nature of groundbreaking legislation. But I think we've made a jolly good fist at getting this legislation right. And Mr Chair, that is why I recommend this legislation to the House. Um, I call the Right Honourable David Carter. Thank you, Mr Chair. I wanted to... Um